May I invite Dr. Sanjay Agarwala, please come on the stage, sir. Dr. Sanjay Agarwala needs no introduction. He is the Director, Professional Services and Head of the Orthopedics at Hinduja Hospital. He is also a visiting consultant at Bridge Kenyu Hospital in Mumbai. He is the Founder Trustee and the Past President of ISHK. He has over 85 publications in peer-reviewed journals and he is active contributor in the field of research in orthopedics. His research has established a made in India Atmanirbha solution using bisphosphonate successfully for crippling and painful disease of AVN. He has over 37 years of successful practice in adult reconstructive surgery of the joint arthroplasty and complex trauma. He has mentored many postgraduate students who has risen to great heights. Dr. Sanjay Agarwala has successfully blended the best of the East and the West to bring world-class care for the benefits of the Indian patients by his large contribution to academics and basic research. The years of experience, clinical knowledge and surgical excellence have defined his successful career and he continues to give his best to the society. I request him to deliver the RJ Katra Oration. Sir, please come. Earlier on, when I had asked Rajesh, who do I thank? He said, sir, Bombay Orthopedic Society. So with that, I thank Bombay Orthopedic Society for having selected me two years ago for the next group of BOS members to have agreed and for the present BOS executive to have me on stage today. The Katra Koration, as you know, is the foremost eponymous lecture that is given in the Vairok. At the Katra Koration, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal of Hinduja Hospital. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, thank you for being with us and let's have a, let's say a warm hello to everyone at Vairok, the Western India Regional Orthopedic Conference, where you are giving this oration. Let's say a big hello to them at the start. Hello, so, hello. I am here. The late Dr. R.J. Kathrak was born in the 19th century. He serviced orthopedics in the 20th century and today in the 21st century we still remember him. He was a general surgeon and then decided he would be an orthopedic surgeon. Went to do his MCH ortho in England in 1936 when general surgeons were actually rendering orthopedic services. Came back during the war, was at JJ Hospital, BJ Wadia Hospital, doing conservative rather than very aggressive pediatric orthopedic care. Went on to be at KEM and at Scion. An outstanding achievement for someone who visited four different hospitals in his lifetime. He was the founder president of the Bombay Orthopedic Club, which then became the Bombay Orthopedic Society, and the first Indian fellow of the British Orthopedic Association. He was an outstanding teacher, is very clear. He was the teacher to Dr. A.K. Talwalkar, Dr. Ellen Vora, who I had the privilege of being registrar for two years during my MS. He had an outstanding memory almost photographic. And Dr. K.T. Dholakia, who I worked with for 18 years when he would come to P.D. Hinduja Hospital. Dr. Dholakia would stay the night, rehearse the operation and write the
the procedure on his hand. The fate of the patient was not in the hands of the patient. It was on the hands of Dr. Katie Dolakia. And many of us who have worked with him and interacted with him know what an outstanding man he was. And Dr. R.J. Katrak was his teacher. So what drives you? So what drives me? That's the whole idea of this R.J. Katrak oration. I think it's inspiration with perspiration. It's a winning combination. And as has already been explained, my journey, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants, a cliche. But truly, these were the giants I worked with. I was a house officer with Dr. R.M. Bansali. I had Dr. Pradhan and SKB, Dr. Bandare, as the vice or deputy honoraries at that time. I was a student of Dr. M. N. Shahane and the only and first student of his who actually had the privilege and the occasion to work with him because I was assigned to the Ellen Bora unit. Dr. Saraf, an outstanding man, he would say, Beta, start karo, khatam mat karna. So I had a lot of surgical experience because of Dr. Saraf. And Dr. Ingalikar, Dr. Joshipura, Dr. Chowal were the contemporary teachers of our times. And I think those were the shoulders on whom I stood. KM was, of course, the alma mater. I gathered a couple of first ranks, a couple of medals. But the turning point in my career was when I got the International Graduate Fellowship Award of the Rotary Foundation. I pipped a man no other than the current dean of Harvard University, Dr. Datar. And the two of us were the final contenders and this must be the only time that Dr. Dataro has ever been beaten by anyone. It was me. I went on to Oswestry in 1982 under Professor Brian O'Connor. In those days, there were only six professors in the entire UK. He was one of them. I went to Northwick Park Hospital in 84, worked with Leslie Kleneman, whose interest was foot. And later on, Leslie Kleinman became the professor of orthopedics at Liverpool. At Liverpool in 1985, I won the Ro Norman Roberts Medal, which was generally not given to a lot of outsiders. And Norman Roberts himself was alive on the day that this was presented to me. I went to Johns Hopkins to do a fellowship with Schmeiser and Stoke on Trent in 1986 before returning to India to the PD Hinduja Hospital where I have been for the last 37 years. Breach Candy Hospital is where I also have an affiliation. And I think I am a clinical scientist, a clinician and a scientist, because I have authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers. I'm not going to take you through my 100 papers, but I'll take you through papers that really matter and the ones that will work for you. So every time I meet you, uh, something good happens. Either my film becomes a hit or I get a nice film. So I'm hoping something else happens. So wow, she said that some of her success was due to me. And these are the kind of privileges I've had working at the Hinduja Hospital. At Derby, I did hand surgery with Frank Burke, who took the mantle of the unit which was started by Guy Pulvertaft. You will remember Pulvertaft sutures. And having done this hand surgery, I started using the surgical microscope for replantation surgeries and came back to India and started the replantation program at Hinduja Hospital. My interest took me to write papers in the British Journal of Plastic Surgery using nerve conduits. I used Gore-Tex for nerve conduit successfully. However, the spine was what I was introduced to by Dr. M. N. Shahane and my Harrington Rod fixation paper, which was my thesis, also won the Masalawala Award at the Wairock way back in 1982. Having worked with John Dove, I brought back to India the heart cell rectangle fixation. Thereafter, the heart cell rectangle was copied. I think Pitker was the first people who copied it for me. John Dove was very annoyed that I was having it copied, but that was the only way 
I could do segmental spinal fusion, but micro lumbar discectomy because I had an interest in the use of the surgical microscope. I brought to India and in fact, I don't know if Dr. Ingalaykar is here, but I was the uh, invited speaker for his Asia Pacific at the Taj in 1987-89 when uh, he asked me to talk about micro lumbar discectomy. No one for either neurosurgery or spine was doing micro lumbar discectomy at that time. Thanks to the largies of my trustees, they bought me the Holmium laser machine, almost a crore in those days, difficult to buy and I was doing YAG, Holmium YAG laser assisted disc decompression successfully under local anesthesia. But I think there is a reason why there is a phrase in English, pain in the back and pain in the spine, never seems to go away. The good patients would do very, very well. The bad patients kept coming back to haunt you. And I decided I would do some trauma. And trauma is something that we all learned when I was at KEM and when I was in England and when we did the AO courses, we learned from our skills to do trauma. So we did fix the damage. Done. And we were fixing the damage done. Recognizing that there were certain shortfalls and recognizing the need for some innovation, I realized that fixing distal radius fractures would be a great thing. This met with a certain degree of criticism from senior orthopedic surgeons stating that this was totally overkill. I had to publish it and the only journal that would accept it in that time was the Bombay Hospital Journal. I published it to show that this was the way of the future for Coley's fractures and now it's virtually a standard of care. Patients and you recognize this very old plate right in the beginning and the patient was able to do this in 10 days time. If he was a surgeon or if even if he was a taxi driver, this was the way forward for the treatment of Coley's fracture. Patella fixation, 1% of all fractures that come to a busy trauma practice are patella fractures. That is the statistics. If you do the Mueller technique, the KOR keeps backing out. I described the technique where I combined Schauwecker's figure of eight with the pry forward and essentially once you have the figure eight, the pi forward, you can add one or two wires more, the patient heals. My colleagues at Hinduja Hospital have seen this again and again. Patients are walking within one day of the surgery and there is no risk of the K wire backing out. We were seeing a certain number of tendo Achilles and all these repairs would break down because of skin complications. I described in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery in the Asia Pacific region how I would do a minimal access and maybe I can show it to you here. I would come through the skin here, go back through the same skin incision and cut the bridge with a 15 number blade or 11 number blade. So effectively now I had a percutaneous technique in this portion and therefore these wounds would do very, very well. We were dealing with atypical fractures again and again and none of them because of my bisphosphonates and there was a problem getting these to heal and I suggested and published that vigorous endosteal reaming across fracture sites aids union and let me show you this in a little expanded version. You can probably see here how there's a cloud of bone formation. You take the reamer 10 times across the fracture. This cloud then remains here and aids the healing and therefore even these difficult fractures can heal better if you are electing to nail them if you've done vigorous endosteal re uh, reaming in this portion. We published all this. Ankle fractures, particularly the fibula, if you try to do the Weber and Vassy anti-glide technique, the fracture shifts. Recognizing this, I started twisting the plate 
and published this in 2020, where I would twist the LCP, a strong plate, put it across so that it would conform and then the results were excellent. I don't think AO copied me, but simultaneously they were working on similar principles and their, their new plate has got a twist in it. My use of medicines to get fractures to heal is legendary. I have also repurposed denosumab for recalcitrant bone healing, published in the BMJ. And any of you wonder what technique I use, you just need to put Agarwala in BMJ for recalcitrant bone healing and you will find the paper. Yeah. What is it? Now, trauma clearly yeah. brought me what to the like? yeah. So, we, I treated people. She went on after this foot injury that she had and they were all worried that she would never dance again. That was her career. She went on immediately after that to dance in the movie Devdas. Surgical management of arthritis was, of course, something that was of interest to me. So when I came back from England, I recognized that there was a place for a high tibial osteotomy. But the staple that we were using was very, very loose. I added and created the box osteotomy where I had a ledge at the back and a ledge in front. When this closed along with the staple, this locked like a box and this was a stable way of doing a high tibial osteotomy, a lateral closed wedge. The patients did well. When AO introduced their locking plates, I thought that was even a better way of holding the fracture and I didn't need any plaster supports, etc. And these worked well as well. Soon after, I realized that the biplanar osteotomy of the AO, which was an open biplanar osteotomy, was an excellent way of doing high tibial osteotomies. And note the ledge that even they have preserved here. Or can, they have this ledge here, and that's the ledge which allows for greater contact and therefore greater stability of the high tibial osteotomy. So I'm not saying they copied me, but I think they were also working similarly on similar principles. And this kind of patient did well. But like I said, I recognized that even though there was this box osteotomy, that was eponymous with my name, the open wedge osteotomy was better because it had better outcomes. In turn, when we became members of Aishka, I was a founding member, founding trustee, became president, I realized that we really need to get our patients in and out faster. Dr. Pachare is here, you know, remember we used to keep patients for two, two weeks in the early, early days when we were working with Dr. Dolakia, which was a great way for the patient to get confidence. But the average length of stay, the ALOS, was tremendously long. And all of us, I think, all over the country, worked at working towards fast track recovery. I published this some time ago. And what even Mogambo Vikushogyai said, patients were comfortable to go home on the second day. Preoperative or perioperative education and physiotherapy, of course, helped. Periarticular infiltration was helpful. We do adductor canal blocks along with the periarticular because then that works extremely well for the back of the knee, ice packs, prophylaxis, anticoagulants, DVD socks, and intermittent compression so devices all the time with immediate mobilization. Because I really believe DVT is a problem. So, all of you are feeling much better now. The common belief is that Indians don't get DVT. My work, and you notice the date, 2002, 2003, showed that DVT exists in Indian patients and can be prevented with prophylaxis. An issue that's not been recognized is that MRSA, a 
affects Indian patients. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. We published it. There is a prevalence, surprisingly, of MRSA. Screening prior to all elective surgery helps you identify it. Three days of mupirocin in the nose and axilla clears the colonization. In fact, just four or five days ago, I had a total hip replacement, which I cancelled because he was methicillin resistant, staph aureus, isolated in his nose. Post surgery, patients hate the staple removal. It hurts. Might hurt for only one minute, but it hurts. And a physical follow up is required. I have a certain cohort of patients who come from outside of Bombay, even New Bombay, or maybe even Satara. Now, those kind of patients, they need to reach a doctor, and often their fear is when they go to their local doctor, he will say, Jidar karayata udar jao. Sad, but it is true. I have introduced this concealed cosmetic closure for total knee replacement surgery. And it's a superior cosmetic healing. It has minimal complications and great satisfaction for the patient. Here is a hip replacement. About eight days after surgery, he's come to my clinic. I am removing the dressing for the first time. And that's it. He could have gone to Dubai and done this. He could have had it done in Delhi, wherever he came from. This is the way to be so that the patient does not have to worry about suture removal. Of course, now coming to replacements of hip and knee. I have been found a member of Aish, current trustee, past president. My greatest concern was that we would get patients who wanted hip and knee surgery. And we would tell all these patients, you can only sit on a chair. For the last 25 years, I've been offering all my patients this degree of mobility. I'm going to share some of this with you. I think the magic in our hands is when we can give normal joint function after replacement. And look at the population. Asia and Africa, that's 78, 80% of the world. China, India, Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa. These are the requirements. And this, after standard replacement surgery, we say is not allowed. Western culture requirements we claim is this. They kneel if they go to church. If they play golf, they need to be sitting like this. And should we be telling them that they have restricted movements? We've not done them any great favors. Mayo Clinic handout. Avoid crossing, twisting your legs. Avoid bending from your waist more than 90 degrees. Don't bring your knee up higher than your hip. Don't reach down to pull blankets. When lying in bed, this is crippling. This is what I offer all my hip replacements and I'll share how and all my knee replacements and I'll share how and I think this is what we should as surgeons be offering our patients. There is an armamentarium and just like Maki Farah showed that large heads work, we have seen how the BHR, which I still think has place, how delta motion, great prosthesis, used to work, unlike the ASR, great prosthesis did not work, but has been withdrawn because there must have been problems. But the principle of a large head is of course a great principle. And we published this a retrospective analysis of our midterm results. And when Andy Murray needed a hip replacement, he opted for the large head BHR. So large heads would give this kind of range of movement, we understand. However, Sometimes when the muscles are weak and you have a patient with polio or you have a patient with a TC fracture, he also, you cannot expect someone to prevent him from doing things that he's done for the last 70 years of his life. You offer him a dual mobility. 
and we published about this dual mobility how this is a great prosthesis evolutus is one of the companies striker is another and the whole lot of companies now offering it is available freely now in india is something to adopt but the magic the magic is in getting the same stability and function with a standard dhr and i test for impingement and free hip stability i do an anterior approach as most of you know and does that work well we check and there are a whole lot of nuances to doing this but if the patient has this degree of stability this is the patient who can dance and i asked yogesh patkar who you've seen on ztv whether i could use his video from youtube he says i please do that and this is what i did for him this man is dancing and he's sitting on the floor like a normal person this is the magic which is in the hands of all of you adapt Why like God, God, this is and <laughs> do it so what mayo clinic has told the world at my hands doesn't matter we can get them to get full range of movement along with dr junjunwala dr pachure and i we wrote about this paper where we did revisions of course we would be doing revision because we were doing primary hips when you have a trunnion and you want to preserve the the prosthesis in the femur you want to save the trunnion and you can't be putting things like gauze pieces and thing that will work all you need is a foley catheter you roll it it saves it and you can get along and revise your acetabulum we published this in the annals of the royal college of surgeons of england likewise for total knees i don't want to restrict their movements do i have something that i can use for the total knee yes i do in the quest for the high flex total knee i started using the rpf the problem with the rpf i found and when i spoke to the designer surgeon he said sanjay you should publish it challenged me to do it I published it in the journal of arthroplasty this is what was happening with the rpf the patella clunk thereafter the company changed the model and finally they have withdrawn it unfortunately but clearly there were problems with that i have been using the smith and nephew currently that's the oxinium it gives me a great range i have a ps the high flex the constraint give me a second life when he did my knee and patients can get normal knees here's a patient who came to me with fixed flexion deformity pre op day 1 of surgery and i told you i do very fast mobilization 2 weeks and at 1 month i have a patient who's come from a village i can't expect this patient to use a commode i have them get normal movements yet another patient with a knee replacement and this i give to 99% of my patients for the last 25 years hips and knees with full movements that is the right way to do it and i think you all should also adapt and adopt the techniques which are required to get this kind of movement now we come to bisphosphonates the avascular necrosis I've been doing this for 25 years. Transient osteoporosis, spontaneous osteonecrosis, AVN in post leukemia, AVN other than hip and post covid AVN. Now covid is all around us. These are all the papers that have been spawned by my interest in managing AVN. And give us your magic pills all the time. <laughs> and that's Helen saying give us the magic pills. My 20 year study was published in 21 in the jbjs and the most recent publication which is waiting to be published and has been accepted by the american jbjs in september is about covid and avn and anyone who is practicing orthopedics in this lot has seen avn after covid 101% i am going to show you how to treat this without surgery I've been publishing since 2001. When I say publishing from 2001, believe me, I was working on it five years before that. 
you cannot publish. Start today and publish tomorrow. So I've been doing this, like I said, for 25 years. We have multiple publications and it has spawned a whole lot of publications over a period of time. If you have smartphones and you wish to take this protocol, I would recommend it. I'm going to show it to you again in about another two or three minutes. You need to give zolendronic acid once a year. You need to give alendronate in small doses. I used to, I had started by giving 10 milligrams, but the companies have withdrawn that. 70 milligrams is less absorbed. You need to give calcium and vitamin D and let's look at the rationale. Why a combination of two bisphosphonates? Alendronate is efficacious. Publications, look at a publication number four, 2005. Publication five, 2006. I published in 2001. The fact of the matter is that the effect of alendronate starts only after 12 weeks, up to one year. A patient who's in pain is not going to wait. The reason is alendronate at the best of times is, a, is only absorbed by 2%. So if pain improvement is late, patient is going to withdraw from your treatment and there will be decreased compliance. In 2013, 13, 2006, five years after my publication, 2010, people used only intravenous bisphosphonates and showed that it was not effective. You would get early blood levels, some pain improve, improvement. But it didn't work. Of course it wouldn't work. You're not treating osteoporosis. You're treating an acute disease. In 2002, there was this scientific paper which showed that resorption of necrotic bone is prevented in rat animals by doses which are 4 to 50 times higher than for osteoporosis. You cannot treat AVN with the same dose that you would treat osteoporosis. We recognized that edema was settling down and in 2019 I published the transient osteoporosis of the hip. You have seen these cases, extremely painful, some even opt for surgery, at four months disappeared after you use bisphosphonates. Yet another case, I don't want to take you through multiple cases, but this is proved by literature and my publications. Spunk, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, same thing at presentation and four months. I was in Belgium and they were operating a patient of spunk because the patient had so much pain. If they had done my treatment and waited maybe six weeks, the patient would have resolved. This is confirmatory evidence that you can see in these publications. So our rationale is, you give zolendronic acid, which gives you early blood levels, pain relief because it reduces edema, you give oral alendronate, prevents collapse, combined therapy, the treatment protocol for those of you who didn't get a chance to take this picture, give this, this will work. The natural history of AVN is three years, you need to give this for three years unless you're doing multiple MRIs and patients as well, we can stop it earlier. And the established safety of bisphosphonate is three years. So I have repurposed this drug. The drug repurposing is the practice of finding novel therapeutic indications for existing approved drugs. Now these are just some of the examples. There are hundreds of drugs which have been repurposed. I grew up taking aspirin for my fevers when I was a child. Chloroquine. You treat malaria with four stat, two after six hours, one BD for two days. We all know that. But when you use chloroquine for rheumatoid arthritis, the dose is different. Same thing with bisphosphonates for AVN, spunk, and transient osteoporosis. We have repurposed denosumab for recalcitrant bone healing when you have well fixed fractures. And look at this not healing, nine months healing. You can see how this callus is formed with the use of denosumab in the right doses. Coming back to AVN, this is just some illustrative examples. 
stage two bilateral look at him at four years doing well case of stage three almost stage four i mean there's a little bit of arthritis you could say at presentation at three years at 12 years we've avoided surgery for this patient i think i've done him a service and this is what is critical whether you're drilling it you're doing forage whether you're doing stem cells or whether you're doing platelets can you assure 98 percent in stage one 92 percent in stage two and 77 in stage three if the answer is no then you're doing a disservice by offering that patient surgery and this is all published data you can check it up 15 publications it's all there in that and i've not seen any case of atypical fractures and osteonecrosis because we confined it for three years i think i've rewritten the chapter of management of avn avn in leukemia you have acute lymphoblastic anemia and very very small children young children would you be offering these patients a crippled life or would you offer them a total hip replacement I think at four years, if the patient can do this, I think she's doing very well. It's a young child. As a hip replacement surgeon, should I have been telling him stay crippled till you are adult? Or should I be saying get a hip replacement at that young age? This patient did well and there he is. He is doing all activities that his brother can do. Avascular necrosis other than hip. Well, there it is. The talus, you can see. Scaphoid, treated without surgery with bisphosphonates. Lunate, cane box, treated. And now we come to COVID. We are living with it. Um, all of us are carrying masks. And we've seen this. I published this in BMJ very recently. And what we saw that in COVID, the mean dose of steroid in world literature was 2,000 milligrams. You can get AVN. Our study showed about 350 milligrams. And our study showed that it was happening much faster. So COVID is a disastrous disease for the bones. A lower dose of steroid and a very early onset of AVN is happening. And this has been written up. We have been seeing this too in our patients. And again, what have we done? We've treated this medically. This has been accepted for publication by the American JBJS. Should be in print in the next couple of weeks. I have a medical line of treatment successful for the management of AVN of these patients. And every single one of you who's practicing has seen COVID AVNs right now. And that's the kind of team I work with. I mean, huge team. In fact, there are a whole lot of people in the front row here who worked with me and worked along with me. And that's the kind of team I work with. And there you can see Dr. Bhalera, who was my teacher and he was my colleague in Hinduja, Dr. F.D. Dastur, and Dr. Zavar, Dr. Tempton Udwadia, Dr. V.R. Joshi. And that's my team. I work with a team. Team is everything. Zimbabwe, great player. Team let him down. The other chap, the team helped him. So he took the World Cup. I think 1% inspiration, but 99% ins perspiration, as Thomas Edison said. Work should be evidence-based all the time. Whatever is different must be studied, and novel treatments must be shared. That's what BOS is for, Wyrock is for, and what all of us as colleagues are for. Ideas, motivation, creativity. And you need to put in your hard work, the effort, and the determination to turn the ideas into reality so that they can be shared in forums like this or amongst your colleagues. The impossible we are doing all the time. You and I are doing this impossible things all the time. It's miracles that take a little longer. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.